Chapter 2 Preparation for Learning Lucid Dreaming Learning How to Learn Many people experience lucid dreams after reading or hearing about lucid dreaming for the first time. This may be akin to beginner's luck. They heard it could be done and so they did it. As a result of indulging your curiosity about lucid dreaming by buying this book, you may already have had a lucid dream or two, but you probably have not learned how to have lucid dreams whenever you want. This chapter will provide you with background knowledge and skills that you will need for practicing the lucid dreaming techniques in the following chapters. Before you set out to explore the world of lucid dreaming, you need to know some basic facts about your brain and body in sleep. Then it may help you to know about the origins of common mental blocks that prevent people from committing themselves to the task of becoming aware in their dreams. Your lucid dream training will start with keeping a dream journal and improving your dream recall. Your journal will help you discover what your dreams are like. The next step will be to use your collection of dreams to find peculiarities, which are dream signs that appear often enough in your dreams to be reliable signposts of the dream state. Your list of dream signs will help you succeed with the lucid dream induction techniques presented in chapter 3 and 4. When you are familiar with your ordinary dreams and have learned how to become more or less lucid at will, you will be ready to try out some of the applications described in the later chapters of this book. But first, it is important that you focus your mind on learning the preliminary skills and background information required for becoming a lucid dreamer. You cannot write poetry until you learn the alphabet. Sleeping brain, dreaming mind. People are mystified by the need for sleep. Why do we turn ourselves off for eight hours out of 24? Some likely answers are to restore the body and mind and to keep us out of trouble during the dark hours. But to call sleep a mystery begs an even larger question. What does it mean to be awake? A basic definition of being awake is to be aware. Aware of what? When we speak of sleep and wakefulness, we are referring to awareness of the outside world. Yet, while asleep and unaware for the most part of the outside world, one can still be aware, and thus awake, in a world within the mind. There are degrees of wakefulness. Lucy dreamers are more aware of their real situation. They know they are dreaming. Thus, we can say they are awake in their dreams. Exponents of traditional methods for achieving higher consciousness speak of awakening, meaning increasing one's awareness of one's place in the cosmos. But how does anyone or anything come to be aware? Awareness in biological organisms is a function of the brain. The sensory organs detect information, light, sound, heat, texture, odour in the world and transmit it 
to the brain. The brain interprets the information and synthesizes it into a conception of what is happening in the outside world. The brains with most with which we experience our world, whether dreaming or awake, are the product of biological evolution. During the past thousands of millions of years, living organisms have competed in Mother Nature's life and death game of eat or be eaten, survival of the fittest. The simplest one-celled organisms don't know until they bump into something, whether it is predator or prey. If it is food, they engulf it. If it is a predator, they are eaten. This is obviously a dangerously ignorant way to try to stay alive. Since knowing what is going on around you obviously has enormous survival value, creatures gradually evolved sense organs that allowed them to predict whether they should approach or avoid something in their environment without having to bump into it. Over billions of generations, organisms developed increasingly sophisticated nervous systems and correspondingly reliable and precise capacities for perceiving the environment and controlling their actions. Our brain maintains an up-to-date model of what's going on in the world and predicts what may happen in the future. Prediction requires using previously acquired information to go beyond the information currently available. If you are a frog and a small dark object flies by, information built into your frog brain through evolution allows it to predict that the object is edible and zip, you have eaten a fly. Or if a large shadow suddenly falls on your lily pad, information also acquired through evolution allows your frog brain to predict danger and plop. Frogs, frogs do not see the same world we do. The complex patterns of colour, light, shade and movement that we can identify as trees, flowers, birds or ripples in water. The frog's world is probably composed of simple elements like small flying objects, food, large approaching object, danger, pleasant warmth, sunlight, or attractive sound, frog of the other sex. Although the human brain is far more complex than that of the frog, it works on the same basic principles. Your brain accomplishes its world modeling task so well that you ordinarily aren't aware that it is modeling anything. You look with your eyes and you see. The experience of visual perception seems as straightforward as looking out a window and simply seeing what is there. Nevertheless, seeing, hearing, feeling or perceiving through any other sense is a process of mental modeling, a simulation of reality. The contents of your consciousness, that is, your current experiences, are constructed and depend on your present purposes, what you are doing and what relevant information is currently available. The mind in sleep. If you are awake and engaged in some kind of activity, walking, reading, ETC, your brain is actively processing external sensory input from the environment, which, together with your memory, provides the raw material from which you construct a model of the world. While awake and active, the model accurately reflects your relationship 
to the external world. If you are awake, but physically inactive, the balance of input moves from the external to the internal. To a certain extent, your thinking becomes independent of external stimuli. Your mind wanders. You daydream. With part of your mind, you are modelling worlds that might be, rather than the current actual environment. Still, you tend to maintain a reduced model of the external world and your attention can easily be drawn back to it. If, for example, some sign of danger appears. In the case of sleep, so little sensory input is available from the outside world that you stop maintaining a conscious model of it. When your sleeping brain is activated enough to construct a world model in your consciousness, the model is mostly independent from what is happening in your environment. In other words, a dream, the sleeping brain isn't always creating a multi-dimensional world model. Sometimes it seems to be merely thinking or doing very little. The differences in mental activity during sleep depend largely upon differences in the state of the sleeper's brain. Sleep is not a uniform state of passive withdrawal from the world, a scientist thought until the 20th century. There are two distinct kinds of sleep, a quiet phase and an active phase which are distinguished by many differences in biochemistry, physiology, psychology and behaviour. Changes in brain waves, electrical activity measured at the scalp, eye movements and muscle tone are used to define the two states. The quiet phase fits fairly well with the common sense view of sleep as a state of restful inactivity. Your mind does little while you breathe slowly and deeply. Your metabolic rate is at a minimum and growth hormones are released facilitating restorative process. When awakened from this state, people feel disorientated and rarely remember dreaming. You can observe this state in your cat or dog when it is quietly sleeping in a moderately relaxed posture. In the case of cats, the sphinx posture. And breathing slowly and regularly. Incidentally, this is the phase of sleep in which sleep talking and sleepwalking occur. The transition from quiet to active sleep is quite dramatic. During the active sleep phase, commonly called rapid eye movement or REM sleep, your eyes move rapidly about, under closed lids of course, much as they would if you were awake. Your breathing becomes quick and irregular. Your brain burns as much fuel as it does when you're awake and you dream vividly. If you're male, you probably will have an erection. If you're female, increased vaginal blood flow. While all this activity is happening in your brain, your body remains almost completely still, except for small twitches, because it is temporarily paralysed during REM sleep to prevent you from acting out your dreams. The sleep paralysis of REM sleep doesn't always turn off immediately upon awakening. This is why you may have experienced waking up and not being able to move for a minute. Sleep paralysis can seem a terrifying experience, but actually it is quite harmless and indeed can even be useful for inducing lucid dreams. 
See chapter 4. You can get a good view of paradoxical sleep and REM sleep is called in Europe when you see your cat or dog sleeping, totally collapsed, breathing irregularly, twitching, showing eye movements and in the case of dogs, tail wagging, whimpering, growling and barking. This is when people justifiably say, look, Spotto is dreaming. The sleeper's night journey. Quiet sleep is itself divided into three sub-stages. Stage one is a transitional state between drowsy wakefulness and light sleep, characterized by slow drifting eye movements and vivid brief dreamlets called hypnagogic from Greek meaning leading into sleep imagery. Normally, you quickly pass through stage one into stage two, which is bona fide sleep and is characterized by unique brainwave patterns called sleep spindles or K-complexes. Mental activity at this point is sparse, mundane and thought-like. Typically, after 20 or 30 minutes, you sink deeper into delta sleep, so named after the regular large slow brain waves that characterize this stage of quiet sleep. Very little dream content is reported from delta sleep. Interestingly, this state of deep and dreamless sleep is highly regarded in some Eastern mystical traditions as the state in which we establish contact with our innermost consciousness. According to the Swami Rama, it is when the inner world can be suffused with the full light of the highest universal consciousness. The ego state of waking consciousness drops away. Moreover, the personal aspects of the unknown mind are temporarily abandoned. The memories, the problems, the troubled dream imagery are left behind. All the limitations of the personal unconscious are drowned out in the full light of the highest consciousness. After gradually entering, entering the deepest stage of delta sleep and lingering there, for 30 or 40 minutes, you come back up to stage 2. Approximately 70 to 90 minutes after sleep onset, you enter REM sleep for the first time of the night. After 5 or 10 minutes of REM, and possibly following a brief awakening in which you would likely remember a dream, you sink back into stage 2, and probably delta coming up again from another REM period, approximately every 90 minutes, and so on through the night. While learning and practicing lucid dreaming, you should keep in mind two elaborations on this cycle. Number one, the length of REM periods increases as the night proceeds, and two, the intervals between REM periods decrease with time of night from 90 minutes at the beginning of the night to perhaps only 20 to 30 minutes eight hours later. Finally, after five or six periods of dreaming sleep, you wake up for perhaps the 10th or 15th time of the night. We awaken this many times on an average night, but we promptly forget it happened just as you may forget a conversation with someone who calls you in the middle of the night. Having completed your tour of a night's journey through sleep, you may wonder in which stage of loose sleep lucid dreaming occurs. How we found the answer to this question is a story that deserves retelling. Communicate from the dream world. What if you slept... And what if in your dream, in your sleep, you dreamed? And what if in your dream, you went to heaven 
and there you plucked a strange and beautiful flower. And what if when you awoke, you had the flower in your hand? Ah, what then? Samuel Taylor Coleridge Throughout history, poets, philosophers and other dreamers have been challenged by the fantastic idea of bringing something back from the dream world, something as substantial and real as Coleridge's flower, something to prove that the dream was real as this life. In the late 1970s, when I began my PhD study on lucid dreams at Stanford, I found myself challenged by a seemingly even more hopeless task, proving that lucid dreaming is real. The experts at the time were convinced that dreaming with consciousness that you were dreaming was a contradiction in terms and therefore impossible. Such philosophical reasoning could not convince me since I had experienced lucid dreams, impossible or not. I had no doubt that lucid dreaming was a reality, but how could I prove it to anyone else? To do so, I needed to bring back evidence from the dream world as proof that I had really known I was dreaming during sleep. Simply reporting I had been lucid in a dream after awakening wouldn't prove that the lucidity had occurred while I was actually asleep. I needed some way to mark the time of the lucid dream on a record showing that I had been asleep. I knew that earlier studies had demonstrated that the direction of dreamers' physical eye movements during REM sleep was something exactly the same as the direction that they reported looking in their dreams. In one remarkable example, reported by pioneer sleep and dream researcher Dr. William DeMent, a dreamer was awakened from REM sleep after making a series of about two dozen regular left, right, left, right eye movements. He reported that he was dreaming about a table tennis game. Just before awakening, he had been watching a long volley with his dream gaze. I also knew from my own experience that I could look in any direction I wished while in a lucid dream. So, it occurred to me that I ought to be able to signal while I was having a lucid dream by moving my eyes in a prearranged, recognisable pattern. To test this idea, I spent the night at the Stanford Sleep Laboratory. I wore electrodes that measured my brain waves, eye movements and muscle tone, which my colleague, Dr. Lynn Nagal, monitored on a polygraph while I slept. During the night, I had a lucid dream in which I moved my eyes left, right, left, right. The next morning, when we looked through the polygraph record, we found the eye movement signals in the middle of a REM period. At this writing, dozens of other lucid dreamers have also successfully signalled from lucid dreams, and these dreams have occurred almost exclusively during REM sleep. This method of communication from the dream world has proven to be of inestimable value in the continued study of lucid dreams and dream physiology. The fact that lucid dreamers could remember to perform previously agreed upon actions in their dreams and that they could signal to the waking world made an entirely new approach to dream research possible. By using trained lucid dreamers, we were able to develop the eye movement signaling technique into a powerful methodology. We have found that anironauts can carry out all kinds of experimental tasks, functioning both as subjects and experimenters 
in the dream state. The aeronautical approach to dream research is illustrated by a series of studies conducted at the Stanford Sleep Research Center that have begun to map out mind-body relationships during dreaming. Why dreams seem real? Mind-brain-body relationships during dreaming. One of the earliest experiments conducted by my research team tested the traditional notion that the experience of dream time is somehow different from time in the waking world. We approached this problem of dream time by asking subjects to make an eye movement signal in their lucid dreams. Estimate a 10 second interval by counting 1001, 1002, etc. And then make an other eye movement signal. In all cases, we found time estimates made in lucid dreams were within a few seconds of estimates made in the waking state and likewise quite close to the actual time between signals. From this, we've concluded that in lucid dreams, estimated dream time is very nearly equal to clock time. That is, it takes just as long to do something in a dream as it does to actually do it. You may be wondering then how you could have a dream that seems to last for years or lifetimes. I believe, I believe this effect is achieved in dreams by the same stage tricks that causes the illusion of the passage of time in the movies or theatre. If on screen, stage or dream, we see something, someone turning out the light as the clock strikes midnight, and after a few moments of darkness, we see him turning off an alarm as the bright morning sun shines through the window, we'll accept, pretend, without being aware that we are pretending, that many hours have passed, even though we know it was only a few seconds. The method of having lucid dreamers signal from the dream world by means of eye movements has demonstrated a strong relationship between the gazes of dreamers in the dream and their actual eye movements under closed lids. Researchers interested in this question, but not using lucid dreamers to study it, have had to rely on the chance occurrence of highly recognisable eye movement patterns readily matchable to subjects' reported dream activities. As a result, they usually have obtained only weak correspondences between dreams and actual eye movements. The implication of the strong tie between the movements of the dream eyes and the movements of the actual eyes is that we use the same visual system to look around in the dream world as we do to see the waking world. One of the most dramatic demonstrations of the correspondence between physiology and dream activity came from studies of lucid dream sex. In 1983, we undertook a pilot study to determine the extent to which subjectivity, subjectively experienced sexual activity during REM lucid dreaming would be reflected in physiological responses. Since women report more orgasms in dreams than men do, we began with a female subject. We recorded many different aspects of her physiology that would normally be affected by sexual arousal, including respiration, heart rate, vaginal muscle tone, and vaginal pulse amplitude. The experiment called for her to make specific eye movement signals at the following points. When she realised she was dreaming, when she began sexual activity in the dream, and when she experienced orgasm. She reported a lucid dream in which she carried out the experimental task exactly as agreed upon. 
Our analysis reveals significant correspondences between the dream activities she reported and all but one of the physiological measures. During the 15 second section of her physiological record, which she signalled at the moment of, her, of orgasm, her vaginal muscle activity, vaginal pulse amplitude and respiration rate reached their highest values of the night and they also were consider considerably elevated in comparison to the rest of the REM period. Contrary to expectation, heart rates increased only slightly. Since then, we have carried out similar experiments with two male lucid dreamers. In both cases, respiration showed striking increase in rate. Again, there were no significant elevations of the heart rate. Interestingly, although both or 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 reported vividly realistic orgasms in their lucid dreams, neither actually ejaculated in contrast to the wet dreams commonly experienced by adolescent males, which frequently are not associated with erotic effects on the brain and body. The experiments just reviewed supported the conclusion that the events you experience while asleep and dreaming produce effects on your brain and to a lesser extent your body, much the same as if you were to experience the corresponding events while awake. Additional studies uphold this conclusion. When lucid dreamers hold their breaths or breathe fast in a dream, they really do hold their breaths or pant. Furthermore, the differences in brain activity caused by singing versus counting in the waking state. Singing tends to engage the right hemisphere and counting the left. Are nearly duplicated in the lucid dream. In short, to our brains, dreaming of doing something is equivalent to actually doing it. This finding explains why dreams so, seem so real. To the brain, they are real. We are continuing to study the connection between dreamed actions and physiology with the goal of producing a detailed map of mind-body interactions during dreaming sleep for all measurable physiological systems. Such a map could prove to be of great value for experimental dream psychology and for psychosomatic medicine. Indeed, since dream activities produce real physiological effects, lucid dreaming may be useful for facilitating the functioning of the immune system. More of this in chapter 11. In any case, the physiological effects caused by dreaming show that we cannot dismiss dreams as idle children of the imagination. Although the tendency of our culture has been to ignore dreams, dream experiences are as real to us as waking life. If we seek to improve our lives, we will do well to include our dream lives in our efforts. Social values and lucid dreaming. I have received numerous letters from people with an interest in lucid dreaming who feel restricted because as one writer put it, I can't talk to anyone about this. They all think I'm nuts and look at me oddly if I even try to explain what I do in my dreams. Our culture offers little social support to those interested in exploring mental states. This resistance probably has its roots in the behaviorist perspective in psychology, which treated all animals including humans, as black boxes, whose actions were entirely dependent on external inputs. 
the contents of the mind as of an animal were considered unmeasurable and hence out of the bounds of scientific study. Since the late 1960s, however, science has once again begun to explore the realm of conscious experience. The study of lucid dreaming is an example. However, cultural understanding normally lags behind scientific understanding. Darwin's scientific theories of the evolution of biological organisms are a century old. But the cultural turmoil they caused by upsetting the status quo of accepted thought is still affecting our society. Hence, we are not surprised to find that some people, scientists included, remain resistant to the new, to the West. Capabilities of the human mind that scientific research is discovering and demonstrating. To help you realise that lucid dreams can have a significant and valuable effect on your life, this book includes many personal accounts from lucid dreamers. If you happen to live in a place where you feel you cannot share your dream life, these examples should give you some feeling of connection with others who are exploring their dreams. In addition to the afterword, you will find an invitation to share your experiences with us. Concerns about lucid dreaming. Questions and answers. Might lucid dreaming be dangerous for some people? The overwhelming majority of lucid dreams are positive, rewarding experiences, much more so than ordinary dreams, to say nothing of nightmares. Nevertheless, there probably be, will be some people who find the experience of lucid dreaming frightening and in some cases extremely disturbing. For this reason, we cannot recommend lucid dreaming to everyone. On the other hand, we are confident that for some people, no more than normally neurotic, lucid dreaming is completely harmless. Different people will use lucid dreaming for different purposes. It makes little sense to warn the typical explorer of the dream world away from lucid dreaming because some might use it in a less than optimal manner. If, after reading the first six chapters of this book, you still have serious reservations about lucid dreaming, then we recommend that you not continue. To thine own self be true. Just make sure that it is really yourself to which you are being true. Don't allow others to impose their personal fears on you. Question. I am afraid that if I learn to induce lucid dreams, all my dreams will become lucid. Then what do I do? Answer. The philosopher P.D. Auspiskai experienced conflicting emotions regarding half-dream states, as he called lucid dreams. The first sensation they produced was one of astonishment. I expected to find one thing and found another. The next was a feeling of extraordinary joy which the half-dream states and the possibility of seeing and understanding things in quite a new way gave me. And the third was a certain fear of them because I very soon noticed that if I let them take their own course they would begin to grow and expand and encroach both upon sleep and upon the waking state. I experienced exactly the same fear when I first began attempting to induce lucid dreams. My efforts were soon met with impressive success after a few months. I was having more and more lucid dreams at what suddenly seemed an alarmingly rapid rate of increase. I became afraid 
that I wouldn't be able to control the process. What if all my dreams become lucid? I'm not wise enough to consciously direct all of my dreams. What if I make mistakes? And so on. However, I found that the moment I entertained this worrisome line of thinking, I stopped having lucid dreams. Upon calm reflection, I realised that without my consent, there was really very little chance that all my dreams would become lucid. As both Auspic Sky and I had forgotten, lucid dreaming takes effort. Lucid dreams occur only rarely unless you go to sleep with the deliberate and definite intention to become conscious or lucid in your dreams. Thus, I understood that I would be able to regulate and limit, if necessary, the frequency of my lucid dreams. In fact, after a decade of experience with more than a thousand lucid dreams, I rarely have more than a few per month, unless I have a conscious desire to have more. Question. Since I believe that dreams are messages from the unconscious mind, I am afraid that consciously controlling my dreams would interfere with this important process and deprive me of the benefits of dream interpretation. Answer. As chapter 5 will explain, dreams are not letters from the unconscious mind, but experiences created through the interactions of the unconscious and conscious mind. In dreams, more unconscious knowledge is available to our conscious experience. However, the dream is not at all the exclusive realm of the unconscious mind. If it were, people would never remember their dreams because we do not have waking access to what is not conscious. The person or dream ego that we experience being in the dream is the same as our waking consciousness. It constantly influences the events of the dream through its expectations and biases just as it does in waking life. The essential difference in the lucid dream is that the ego is aware that the experience is a dream. This allows the ego much more freedom and choice and creative responsibility to find the best way to act in the dream. I don't think that you should always be conscious that you are dreaming any more than I think you should always be conscious of what you are doing in waking life. Sometimes self-consciousness can interfere with effective performance. If you are in a situation, dream or waking, in which your habits are working smoothly, you don't need to direct your action consciously. However, if your habits are taking you in the wrong direction, whether dreaming or waking, you should be able to wake up to what you are doing wrong and consciously redirect your approach. As for the benefits of dream interpretation, lucid dreams can be examined as fruitfully as non-lucid ones. Indeed, lucid dreamers sometimes interpret their dreams while they are happening. Becoming lucid is likely to alter what would have otherwise happened, but the dream can still be interpreted. Interpreted. Question. Sometimes in lucid dreams, I encounter situations of otherworldliness, accompanied by the feeling of the presence of great power or energy. At these times, my consciousness expands far beyond anything I have experienced in waking life, so that the experience seems much more real than the reality I know. 
and I become terrified. I cannot continue these dreams for fear that I will never awaken from them, since the experience seems so far out of the realm of waking existence. What would happen if I was unable to awaken myself from these lucid dreams? Would I die or go mad? Despite the seemingly horrific nature of this concern, it amounts to little more than fear of the unknown. There is no evidence that anything you do in a dream could affect your basic brain physiology in a way that is harmful. And as intense as a dream may be, it can't last any longer than the natural course of REM periods, at most an hour or so. Of course, since explorations of the world of dreams have really just begun, there are bound to be regions as yet uncharted, but you should not fear to pioneer them. The feeling of intense anxiety that accompanies the sudden onset of strange experiences in dreams is a natural part of the orientation response. It is adaptive in the waking world for a creature in a new situation or territory to look first for danger. However, the fear is not necessarily relevant to what is happening. You need not fear physical harm in your dreams. When you find yourself in the midst of a new experience, let go of your fear and just see what happens. Chapter 10 covers the theory and practice of facing fears in dreams. Question. They say that if you die in your dream, you really will die. Is this true? Answer. If it were true, how would anybody know? There is direct evidence to the contrary. Many people have died in their dreams with no ill effects, according to the reports they gave after waking up, alive. Moreover, dreams of death can become dreams of rebirth, if you let them, as is illustrated by one of my own dreams. After a mysterious weakness quickly sped, spread through my whole body, I realised I was about to die of exhaustion and only had time for one final action. Without hesitation, I decided that I wanted my last act to be an expression of perfect acceptance. As I let out my last breath in that spirit, a rainbow flowed out of my heart, and I awoke ecstatic. Question. If I use my lucidity in a dream to manipulate and dominate the other dream characters and magically alter the dream environment, won't I be making a habit of behaviour that is not likely to benefit me in waking life? Answer. Chapter 6 discusses an approach to lucid dreams that will help you establish ways of behaving that will be useful to you in waking life. This is to control your own actions and reactions in the dream and not the other characters and elements of the dream. However, this does not mean that we believe it harmful if you choose to enjoy yourself by playing king or queen of dreamland. In fact, if you normally feel out of control of your life or, on, or are an assertive person, you may well benefit from the empowered feeling engendered by taking control of the dream. Question. Won't all these efforts and exercises for becoming lucid lead to loss of sleep? And won't I feel more tired after being awake in my dreams? Is it worth sacrificing my alertness in the daytime just to have more lucid dreams? Answer. Dreaming lucidly is usually just as restful as dreaming non-lucidly. Since lucid dreams tend to be positive experiences, you may actually feel invigorated after them. 
How tired you feel after a dream depends on what you did in the dream. If you battle endlessly and non-lucidly with frustrating situations, you probably will feel more tired than if you realised in the dream that it was a dream and that none of your mundane concerns were relevant. You should work on learning lucid dreaming when you have time and energy to devote to the task. The exercises for increasing dream recall and inducing lucid dreams probably will require that you spend more time awake during the night than usual and possibly that you sleep longer hours. If you are too busy to allot more time to sleeping or to sacrifice any of the little sleep you are getting, it's probably not a good idea for you to work on lucid dreaming right now. Doing so will add to your current stress and you probably won't get very good results. Lucid dreaming, at least at first, requires good sleep and mental energy for concentration. Once you learn the techniques, you should be able to get to a point at which you can have lucid dreams any time you wish, just by reminding yourself you can do so. Question. I am afraid that I may not have what it takes to have lucid dreams. What if, after doing all of the exercises you suggest and devoting a lot of time to it, I still can't learn to have lucid dreams. If I put all that time into it and don't get any results, I will feel like a failure. Answer. One of the greatest stumbling blocks in learning almost any skill is trying too hard. This is especially the case with lucid dreaming, which requires that you sleep well and have a balanced state of mind. If you find you are losing sleep while struggling to have lucid dreams without results, let go of your efforts for a while. Relax and forget about lucid dreaming for a few days or a few weeks. Sometimes you will find that after you let go, lucid dreams will appear. Question. Lucid dreams are so exciting and feel so good that real life pales by comparison. Isn't it possible to get addicted to them and not wish to do anything else? Answer. It may be possible for the die-hard escapist whose life is otherwise dull to become obsessed with lucid dreaming. Whether or not this deserves to be called addiction is another question. In any case, some advice for those who find the idea of slipping their life away for the sake of lucid dreaming is to consider applying what they have learned in lucid dreams to their waking lives. If lucid dreams seem so much more real and exciting, then this should inspire you to make your life more like your dreams more vivid, intense, pleasurable and rewarding. In both worlds, your behaviour strongly influences your experiences. Question. I am currently undergoing psychotherapy. Is it okay for me to try lucid dreaming? Can it assist in my therapy? Answer. If you are in psychotherapy and want to experiment with lucid dreaming, talk it over with your therapist. Not every therapist will be well informed about lucid dreaming and its implications for therapy. So make sure your therapist understands what you are talking about and is familiar with the current information. Chapters 8, 10 and 11 of this book offer ideas of how lucid dreaming may be, may be instrumental in, physio, in, in psychotherapy. If your therapist doesn't think that lucid dreaming would be a good idea for you at this time, follow his or her advice. 
If you disagree, you should either trust the judgment of your current therapist on the issue or find another therapist, ideally one who knows how to help you to work with your lucid dreams therapeutically. Getting to know your dreams. How to recall your dreams. It has been said that everything is dependent upon remembering. And this is certainly true of lucid dreaming. Learning to remember your dreams is necessary if you want to learn how to dream lucidly. Until you have excellent dream recall, you won't stand much chance of having many lucid dreams. There are two reasons for this. First, without recall, even if you do have a lucid dream, you won't remember it. Indeed, we are all we all probably have lost numerous lucid dreams among the many thousands of dreams we have forgotten in the normal course of our lives. Second, good dream recall is crucial because to become lucid, you have to recognize that your dream is a dream while it is happening. Since they are your dreams, and you are trying to recognize, you have to become familiar with what they are like. You know what a dream is in general terms, but dream stories are not always easy to distinguish from accounts of events that actually happened. Dream Dreams in general seem like life, with certain noticeable exceptions. These exceptions are volitions of your expectations about the behavior of the world. So, you need to get to know what your dreams are like, and in particular, what is dreamlike about them. You can accomplish this by collecting your dreams and analyzing them for dreamlike elements. Before it will be worth your time to work on lucid dream induction methods, you should be able to recall at least one dream every night. The following suggestions will help you attain this goal. The first step to good dream recall is getting plenty of sleep. If you are rested, you will find it easier to focus on your goal of recalling dreams and you won't mind taking the time during the night to record them. Another reason to sleep longer is that dream periods get longer and closer together as the night proceeds. The first dream of the night is the shortest, perhaps only 10 minutes in length, while after 8 hours of sleep, Dream periods can be 45 minutes to an hour long. You may have more than one dream during a REM dream period, separated by short arousals that are most often forgotten. It is generally accepted among sleep researchers that dreams are not recalled unless the sleeper awakens directly from the dream rather than after going on to another stage, another stages of sleep. If you find that you sleep too deeply to awaken from your dreams, try setting an alarm clock to awaken you at a time when you are likely to be dreaming. Since REM periods occur at approximately 90 minute intervals, Good times will be multiples of 90 minutes from your bedtime. Aim for the later REM periods by setting the alarm to go off at four and a half, six or seven and a half hours after you go to sleep. Another important prerequisite for recalling dreams is motivation. For many people, it is enough to intend to remember their dreams and remind themselves of this intention just before bed. Additionally, 
it may help to tell yourself you will have interesting, meaningful dreams. Keeping a dream journal by your bed and recording your dreams as soon as you awaken will help strengthen your resolve. As you record more dreams, you will remember more. Suggestions for keeping a dream journal are given below. You should get into the habit of asking yourself this question the moment you awaken. What was I dreaming? Do this first or you'll forget some or all of your dream due to interference from other thoughts. Don't move from the position in which you awaken as any body movement may make your dream harder to remember. Also, don't think of the day's concerns because this too can erase your dream recall. If you remember nothing, keep trying for several minutes without moving or thinking of anything else. Usually, pieces and fragments of the dream will come to you. If you still can't remember any dream, you should ask yourself, What was I just thinking? And how was I just feeling? Examining your thoughts and feelings often can provide the necessary clues to allow you to retrieve the entire dream. Cling to any clues of what you might have been experiencing and try to rebuild the story from them. When you recall a scene, ask yourself what happened before that and before that, reliving the dream in reverse. It doesn't take long to build enough skill at this to trigger a detailed replay of an entire dream simply by focusing your attention on a fragment of memory. If you can't recall anything, try imagining a dream you might have had. Note your present feelings, list your current concerns to yourself and ask yourself, did I dream about that? If after a few minutes all you remember is a mood, describe it in your journal. See below. Even if you don't remember anything in bed, events or scenes of the day may remind you of something you dreamed the night before. Be ready to notice this when it happens and record whatever you remember. In developing dream recall, as with any other skill, progress is sometimes slow. Don't be discouraged if you don't succeed at first. Virtually everyone improves through practice. As soon as you recall your dreams, at least once per night, you're ready to try lucid dreaming. It probably won't take long to reach this stage of readiness and a significant percentage of people who get this far will already be experiencing lucid dreams. Keeping a dream journal. Get a notebook or diary for writing down your dreams. The notebook should be attractive to you and exclusively dedicated for the purpose of recording dreams. Place it by your bedside to remind yourself of your intention to write down dreams. Record your dreams immediately after you awaken from them. You can either write out the entire dream upon awakening from it or take down brief notes to expand later. Don't wait until you get up in the morning to make notes on your dreams. If you do, even if the details of a dream seemed exceptionally clear when you awakened in the night, by morning you may find you remember nothing about it. We seem to have built-in dream erasers in our minds, which make dream experiences more difficult to recall than waking ones. So, be sure to write down at least a few key words about the dream immediately upon awakening from it. You don't have to be a talented writer, 
Your dream journal is a tool and you are the only person who is going to read it. Describe the way images and characters look and sound and smell and don't forget to describe the way you felt in the dream. Emotional reactions are important clues in the dream world. Record anything unusual, the kinds of things that would never occur in waking life. Flying pigs, or the ability to breathe underwater, or enigmatic symbols. You also can sketch particular images in your journal. The drawing, like the writing, does not have to be fine art. It's just a way for you to make an intuitive and rememberable connection with an image that might help you attain lucidity in future dreams. Put the date at the top of the page. Record your dream under the date, carrying over for as many pages as required. Leave a bank page following each dream description for exercises you will do later. If you remember only a fragment of a dream, record it, no matter how unimportant it might seem at the time. And if you recall a whole dream, title your journal entry with a short, catchy title that captures the subject or mood of the dream. The Guardian of the Spring or Riot in the Classroom are examples of good descriptive titles. When you begin to illuminate some raw material in your dream journal, you can look back, back at your dreams and ask yourself questions about them. The use of dream symbols for self-analysis is not the purpose of this book, but many different techniques are available for working with dream journals. There are many different methodologies for interpreting dreams, Lucid dreaming is a state of awareness, not a theory, and as such it can be applied equally to many different kinds of dream work. No matter which kind of analysis you might perform on the contents of your dream journals, you will find that lucid dreaming skills can increase your understanding of the way in which your mind creates symbols. This, in turn, can empower your effort towards integration of the different parts of your personality. See chapter 11. Furthermore, reading over your journal will help you become familiar with what is dreamlike about your dreams, so you can recognise them where they are still happening and become lucid. Dream Signs Doors to Lucidity I was standing on the pavement outside my London home. The sun was rising and the waters of the bay were sparkling in the morning light. I could see the tall trees at the corner of the road and the top of the old grey tower beyond the forty steps. In the magic of the early sunshine, the scene was beautiful enough even then. Now, the pavement was not of the ordinary type, but con consisted of small, bluish, grey, rectangular stones, with their long sides as right angles to the white curb. I was about to enter the house, when, on glancing casually at the stones, my attention became riveted by a passing strange phenomenon, so extraordinary that I could not believe my eyes. They had seemingly all changed their position in the night, and the long sides were now parallel to the curb. Then the solution flashed upon me. Though this glorious summer morning seemed as real as real could be, I was dreaming. With the realisation of this fact, the quality of the dream changed in a manner very difficult to convey to one 
who has not had this experience. Instantly, the vividness of life increased a hundredfold. Never had sea and sky and trees shone with such glamorous beauty. Even the commonplace houses seemed alive and mystically beautiful. Never had I felt so absolutely well, so clear-brained, so inexpressibly free. The sensation was exquisite beyond words, but it lasted only a few minutes, and I awoke. Thanks to a strange little detail, the apparently changed position of the cobblestones, a single out-of-place feature in an otherwise convincingly realistic scene, this dreamer was able to realise that he was dreaming. I have named such characteristically dreamlike features dream signs. Almost every dream has dream signs, and it is likely that we all have our own personal ones. Once you know how to look for them, dream signs can be like neon lights, flashing a message in the darkness. This is a dream. This is a dream. You can use your journal as a rich source of information on how your own dreams signal their dreamlike nature. Then you can learn to recognise your most frequent or characteristic dream signs, the specific ways your dream world tends to differ from your waking world. When people realise they are dreaming, it is often because they reflect on unusual or bizarre occurrences in their dreams. By training yourself to recognise dream signs, you will enhance your ability to use this natural method of becoming lucid. People don't become lucid more often in the presence of dream signs because of a normal tendency to rationalise and confabulate they make up stories to explain what is going on, or they think there must be some explanation. Indeed, there must be. But too rarely does such a half-awake dreamer realise what it actually is. If, on the other hand, the dream sign occurs in the dream of someone who has learned to recognise it, the result is a lucid dream. In a dangerous part of San Francisco, for some reason, I start crawling on the sidewalk. I start to reflect. This is strange. Why can't I walk? Can other people walk upright here? Is it just me who has to crawl? I see a man in a suit walking under a streetlight. Now my curiosity is replaced by fear. I think crawling around like this may be interesting, but it is not safe. Then I think, I never do this. I always walk around San Francisco upright. This only happens in dreams. Finally, it dawns on me, I must be dreaming. S.G. Berkeley, California. I once awoke from a dream in which my contact lenses, having dropped out of my eye, was multiplying like some sort of super prototasm. And I resolved that in future dreams like this, I would notice the mutant lens as a dream sign. And indeed, I have become lucid in at least a dozen dreams by recognising this peculiar oddity. Each of us has his or her, her own individual dream signs. Though some are familiar to most of us, like the case of going to work in your pyjamas, the illustrative inventory of dream signs below can help you look for your personal dream signs. But remember, 
that your dream signs will be as unique as you are. The Dream Sign Inventory lists types of dream signs organised according to the way people naturally seem to categorise their experiences in dreams. There are four primary categories. The first one, Inner Awareness, refers to things that dreamers, egos, perceive as happening within themselves, such as thoughts and feelings. The other three categories, action, form and context, classify elements of the dream environment. The action category includes the activities and motions of everything in the dream world. The dream ego from characters and objects. Form refers to the shapes of things, people and places, which are often bizarre and frequently transform in dreams. The final category is context. Sometimes in dreams, the combination of elements, people, places, actions or things is odd. Although there is nothing inherently strange any item, about any item by itself, such strange situations are context dream signs. Also included in the context category are events like finding yourself in a place you, what you are unlikely to be, meeting other characters in unusual places, finding objects out of place, or playing an unaccustomed role. Each category is divided into subdivisions and illustrated with examples from real dreams. Read the inventory carefully so that you understand how to identify dream signs. Then the next exercise will guide you through the process of collecting your own. The lucid dream induction techniques in the following chapters will make use of the dream sign targets that you come up with in this exercise. The dream sign inventory. Inner awareness. You have a peculiar thought, a strong emotion, feel an unusual sensation, or have altered perceptions. The thought can be one that is unusual that could occur only in a dream, or that magically affects the dream world. The emotion can be inappropriate or oddly overwhelming. Sensations can include the feeling of paralysis, or of leaving your body, as well as unusual physical feelings and unexpectedly sudden or intense arousal. Perceptions may be unusually clear or fuzzy, or you may be able to see or hear something you wouldn't be able to in waking life. Examples Thoughts I'm trying to figure out where the house and furnishings are from, and I realise this is an odd thing to be thinking about. When I thought I didn't want to crash, the car swerved back on the road. When I found the door locked, I wished it open. Emotions. I am filled with extreme anxiety and remorse. I was rhapsodized over G. I am so unbelievably angry at my sister I throw something a woman gave her into the sea. Sensations. I seem to lift out of body. I'm caught in the covers, but shake free. A strong wave of arousal comes over me. It feels like there's a giant hand squeezing my head. Perceptions. Somehow, I could see perfectly without my glasses. Everything looks as though 
I have taken LSD. I somehow can hear two men talking, even though they are far away. Action. You, another dream character, or a dream thing, including inanimate objects and animals. Do something unusual or impossible in waking life. The action must occur in the dream environment, that is, not be a thought or feeling in the dreamer's mind. Malfunctioning devices are examples of object action dream signs. Examples. Ego action. I'm riding home on a unicycle. I was underwater, yet I was breathing. Doing pull-ups got easier and easier. Character action. The staff throws slime worms at the audience. D kisses me in front of his wife. The hairdresser refers to a blueprint to cut my hair. Object action. The Boggoldner lights up. A large flashlight floats past. The car accelerates dangerously and the brakes don't work. Form. Your shape, the shape of a dream character or that of a dream object is oddly formed, deformed or transforms. Unusual clothing and hair count as anomaly anomalies of form. Also, the place you are in, the setting, in the dream, may be different than it would be in waking life. Examples. Ego form. I am a man, dreamed by a woman. I am embodied, embedded in a sack of porcelain plates. I am Mozart. Character form. Her face changes as I look at her. A giant with a creature from the Black Lagoon type of head walks by. Contrary to reality, G's hair is cut short. Setting form. The edge of the beach is like a pier with benches. The drafting room was the wrong shape. I get lost because the streets are not as I remember them. Object form. I see tiny purple kittens. One of the purses transforms completely. My car keys read Toyoma instead of Toyota. Context. The place or situation in the dream is strange. You may be somewhere that you are unlikely to be in waking life or involved in a strange social situation. Also, you or another dream character could be playing an unaccustomed role. Objects or characters may be out of place or the dream could occur in the past or future. Examples Ego role We're fugitives from the law I was a James Bond type of dream It was a James Bond type of dream With me in the starring role I'm a commando behind enemy lines in World War II Character role My friend is assigned to be my husband My father is behaving like R. Reagan, Bush and Nixon are flying jets. Character place. My co-workers and former high school friends are together. Madonna was seated on a chair in my room. My brother, who is dead, was in the kitchen with me. Object place. My bed was in the street. 
there was a phone in my room. The wall had cream cheese and vegetables in it. Setting place. I'm in a colony on Mars. I'm in an amusement park. I'm on the ocean by myself at night. Setting time. I am in grade school. I'm at my 25th high school reunion. I'm with my horse in his prime. Situation. I'm in an odd ceremony. A commercial is being filmed at my house. Two families have been brought together to get to know each other. Exercise. Catalogue your dream signs. Number one. Keep a dream journal. Keep a journal in which you record all your dreams. When you have collected at least a dozen dreams, proceed to the next step. Two, catalogue your dream signs. While continuing to collect dreams, mark the dream signs in your dream reports. Underline them and list them after each dream description. Classify each dream sign using the dream sign inventory. Next to each dream sign on your list, write the name of its category from the dream sign inventory. For instance, if you dreamed of a person with the head of a cat, this would be a form dream sign. 4. Pick target dream sign categories. Count how many times each dream sign category, inner awareness, action, form or context, occurs and rank them by frequency. Whichever occurs most often will be your target dream sign category in the next step. If there is a tie between categories, pick the one that appeals to you. Number five. Practice looking for dream signs while you are awake. Make a habit of examining your daily life for events that fit under your dream sign category. For instance, if your target category is action, study how you, other people, animals, objects and machines act and move. Become thoroughly familiar with the way things usually are in waking life. This will prepare you to notice when something unusual happens in the dream. Goal setting for success. Lucid dreaming is a kind of mental performance and you can enlist the aid of psychological techniques developed for enhancing performance to improve your loosing dreaming skills. Sports psychologists have conducted a considerable amount of research on improving performance. One of the most powerful tools to emerge from their work is the theory and practice of goal setting. Goal setting works. Researchers who have reviewed more than 100 studies concluded that the beneficial effect of goal setting on task performance is one of the most robust and replicable findings in the psychological literature. Furthermore, the re research has revealed many details about the right way to go about setting goals. Here, adapted from one researcher's findings on goal setting, are some tips about the right way to approach learning the skill of lucid dreaming. Exercise. Goal setting for success. Number one. Set explicit, specific and numerical goals. Goals are personal 
and are related to both your potential and your demonstrated abilities. Depending on your level of achievement, you might want to remember one dream every night or two dreams every night or to have at least one lucid dream within the next week or month. When I started my dissertation research, I set myself a goal to increase the number of lucid dreams I had each month. This made it easy for me to evaluate my performance in terms of specific goals. Two, set difficult but realistic goals. For many people, to have a lucid dream is a difficult but realistic goal. For more advanced than aeronauts, a more appropriate goal might be to learn how to fly or to face scary characters. Your performance will increase in proportion to the ambition of your goals as you keep them within the range of your ability. Number three, set short range as long as well as long range goals. Short term goals, like remembering a certain number of dreams or performing a certain number of state tests per day, see chapter three. Also, plan longer range goals, such as having at least one lucid dream per month, set dates by which you would like to achieve a certain level of proficiency. For example, I want to have four lucid dreams by June 1st. Record and evaluate your progress. When you reach a goal you have set, such as having 12 lucid dreams in one month, record this achievement. When you reach a goal, set a new one. Or, if you are getting frustrated, because you are far from attaining your goals, set yourself less demanding and more realistic aims. Keep notes and statistics in your dream journal. A chart may provide a more visible record of your progress. How to schedule your efforts for best results. Many lucid dreamers have reported that their lucid dreams happen most frequently after dawn, in the late morning hours of sleep. A partial explanation for this is that there is more REM sleep in the second half of the night than in the first. Additionally, analysis of the time of occurrence of lucid dreams in the laboratory showed that the relative likelihood of lucid dreaming continually increases with each successive REM period. To illustrate what this means, let's say that ordinarily you sleep for eight hours. In the course of the night, you probably will have six REM periods, with the last half occurring in the last quarter of the night. According to our research, the probability of your having a lucid dream during these last two hours of sleep is more than twice as great as the possibility of your having a lucid dream in the previous six hours. This also means that if you were to cut two hours from your ordinary sleep time, you would half your chances of lucid dreaming. Likewise, if you normally get only six hours of sleep, you could double your chances of lucid dreaming by extending your sleep by two hours. The conclusion is obvious. If you want to encourage the occurrence of lucid dreams, extend your sleep. If you are serious about lucid dreaming and can find the extra time, you should arrange at least one morning a week in which you can stay in bed for several hours longer than usual. Even though most people enjoy sleeping late, we don't all have the time to do it. If you find that you just cannot afford to spend more time in bed, 
there is a simple secret to increasing your frequency of lucid dreaming that requires no more time than the usual number of hours you sleep. The secret is to rearrange your sleep time. If you normally sleep from midnight to 6am, then get up at 4am and stay awake for two hours, doing whatever you need to do. Go back to bed and catch up on your remaining sleep from 6 to 8 a.m. During the two hours of delayed sleep, you will have much more REM than you would have had sleeping at the usual time, 4 to 6, and you will enjoy an increased likelihood of lucid dreaming, with no time lost to sleep. Some lucid dreaming enthusiasts make re rearrange sleep a regular part of their lucid dream induction ritual. For example, Alan Worsley reports that when he wants to induce lucid dreams, he goes to bed at 1.30 a.m. and sleeps a little less than six hours, from about 2 till 7.45. When the alarm clock wakens him, he then gets up and eats breakfast, drinks tea, reads the newspaper, mail, ETC, staying awake for two or three hours. At 9 or 9.30, he writes down in detail his plans and intentions regarding specific experiments or activities he wants to carry out in his lucid dreams and then goes back to bed, usually falling asleep from 10 or 10.30. He then sleeps for several hours, during which he frequently has lucid dreams, sometimes extended series of them lasting up to an hour. Redistributing sleep can be a remarkably powerful way of facilitate to facilitate lucid dreaming. Be sure to try it. For the small amount of effort, you'll be more than amply rewarded. Here is an exercise to get you started. Exercise. Scheduling time for lucid dreaming. 1. Set your alarm. Before going to bed, set your alarm to awaken you 2 to 3 hours earlier than usual and go to sleep at your normal time. 2. Get out of bed promptly in the morning. When your alarm goes off, Get out of bed immediately. You are going to stay awake for two or three hours. Go about your business until about half an hour before returning to bed. Focus number three. Focus on your intentions for your lucid dreams. For the half hour before you return to sleep, think about what you want to accomplish in your lucid dream where you want to go, who you want to see, or what you want to do. You can use this time to incubate a dream about a particular topic. See chapter 6. If you are working on any of the applications in later chapters of this book, this is a good time to practice the exercises for the applications. 4. Return to bed and practice an induction technique. After two or three hours have passed since you awakened, make sure your sleeping place will be quiet and undisturbed for the next couple of hours. Go to bed and practice the induction technique that works best for you. Techniques are provided in the next two chapters. 5. Give yourself at least two hours of sleep. Set your alarm or have someone awaken you if you like, but be sure to give yourself two hours to dream. You are likely to have at least one long REM period in this time, perhaps two. The morning hours are ideal for lucid dreaming for another reason. Although it takes us an hour to an hour and a half to get to REM sleep 
at the start of the night, after several hours of sleep, we often can enter into REM only a few minutes after having been awake. Sometimes we can awaken from a dream and re-enter it minutes later. These facts made possible another type of lucid dream, the wake-induced lucid dream, which is discussed in Chapter 4. Final Preparations Learning to Relax Deeply Before you are ready to practice techniques for inducing lucid dreams, you need to be able to put yourself into a state of attentive relaxation with alert mind and deeply relaxed body. The two exercises described below will show you how. They are important for helping you to clear your mind of the day's worries so that you can focus on lucid dream induction. Lucid dreaming requires concentration, which is nearly impossible to achieve with a distracted mind and tense body. Before going on to the next chapter, master these essential techniques. Exercise. Progressive relaxation. 1. Lie down on a firm surface. If you can't lie down, sit in a comfortable chair. Close your eyes. 2. Attend to your breathing. Pay attention to your breathing and allow it to deepen. Take a few complete breaths by moving your diaphragm down slightly while inhaling, pushing the abdomen out and drawing air into the lungs from the bottom up. Allow yourself to sigh deeply on the exhale, letting tension escape as you do so. 3. Progressively tense and relax each muscle group. Tense and then relax all the muscle groups in your body, one at a time. Begin with your dominant arm. Bend your hand backwards to the wrist, as if you are trying to place the back of the hand on your forearm. Hold it tight for five to ten seconds. Pay attention to the tension. Release the tension and relax. Note the difference. Tense and relax again. Pause for 20 to 30 seconds as you take a deep abdominal breath. Then exhale slowly. Repeat the procedure for the other hand. Then repeat the tension, relaxation, tension, relaxation sequence for your forearms, upper arms, forehead, jaws, neck, shoulders, abdomen, back, buttocks, leg and feet. Pause between each major muscle group. Take a deep breath and release more tension in a sigh. 4. Let go of all tension. After you have worked through all muscle groups, let them go limp. Wherever you feel tension, perform an additional tense and relaxed sequence. Cultivate the image of tension flowing out of your body like an invisible fluid. Every time you tense and relax, remind yourself that the relaxation is greater than the tension that preceded it. Exercise 61 Point Relaxation 1. Study the figure. Figure 2.1 illustrates 61 points on the body. To do this exercise, you need to memorize the sequence of points. 
This is not difficult because the points are arranged in a simple pattern. They begin at the forehead. Travel down and up your right arm, then across to your left arm, down your torso, down and up your right and left legs, then back up your torso to the forehead. 2. Focus your attention on one point at a time. Begin at your forehead. Focus your attention between your eyebrows and think of the number one. Keep your attention fixed at point one for several seconds until you feel that your awareness of the location is clear and distinct. Think of yourself being located at this point. Before moving on to the next point, you should feel a sense of warmth and heaviness at this spot. 3. Move through each point in sequence. In the same manner, successively focus your attention on each of the first 31 points. Proceed slowly and imagine yourself being located at each point as you reach it. Feel the sense of warmth and heaviness before moving on. Do not allow your mind to wander. At first, you may find this difficult to do. You will discover that at times you suddenly will forget that you are doing the exercise and start daydreaming or thinking about something else. If you lose your place, return to the beginning or the last numbered point you attended to and continue. Practice with 31 points until you can attend to them in a sequence without daydreaming or losing track. Extend your practice to include all 61 points. When you can attend to 31 points in sequence, repeat steps 1 and 2 with all 61 points. Practice this until you can do all points without losing your focus. Now you are ready to use this exercise with lucid dreaming induction techniques.